My name is Ed Piskor. I'm Jim Rugg. Before we get into our Stray Bullets conversation, a little bit of business ahead of time, man. Uh, Patreon.com slash Ed is where uh, you can see the serialized version of my Red Room uh, comic strip. There's uh, several dozen pages up there. I put up new pages every Tuesday. Three bucks get you the archive. And it turns out that the pages are up there in a high enough resolution that people are printing out and sending me their bootlegs of, uh, of Red Room comics. They're, they're auditioning for book designer uh, <laughs> position. Yeah, so uh, what a lot of people are doing is just printing it up on paper so that they you know, don't have to stare at the screen. Our audience skews to the age of people who don't like staring into the sun while, while reading their comics, and uh, I'm thrilled with these. Obviously, don't, don't sell them. Uh, <laughs> you know, don't print them in mass, but I, re- I say, like, you know, if you do make them, send me a copy. They look good on newsprint. Yes. Uh, my latest book, Octobriana 1976, the world's first blacklight comic, is out and available. Um, it started out as a Kickstarter. All of those have been sent out. It is now available through local comic shops. And I learned uh, through Amazon as well as Target.com. <laughs> so uh, you can find this almost anywhere now. Um, like I said, world's first blacklight comic. Very unique will not look like any other comics in your collection. So if you're a comic collector, you want something different, definitely check this out. Jim, you want to hazard a guess that the comic we're going to talk about today, Stray Bullets by Dave Lapham, was a big influence to you in the same breath as it is as it was to me? Huge, man. This was 1995 is when this starts. At that point, I was burnt out on Marvel, DC, Image at that time. And I was just looking for, you know, I still wanted to read comics, Stray Bullets comes out. It's a crime comic. It's black and white. It looks great. Totally spoke to me at that time and still did. You know, rereading these this week uh, was just pleasure, you know, and sometimes it doesn't always work that way. So this was huge. You know, I bought this the entire run as it was coming out. Pretty rare. Not too many comics I can say that about, um, but absolutely. It it kind of blew me away. And uh, I knew David Lapham before this, but this was just talk about leveling up. This was incredible. We started this channel doing reviews of Wizard magazines, and one of the one of the real inspirations for even talking about the Wizard magazines was for the Palmer's Picks feature. That would be like one page, uh, you know, tucked deep in the middle, uh, buried in a uh, Wizard magazine. And uh, when I started picking up Wizard, uh, they did their piece. Tom Tom uh, Palmer Jr. did his piece on Dave Lapham. Um, there were several other articles that kind of ganged up a bunch of uh, independent cartoonists because this is the era um, of like a second black and white blip, we'll call it. Uh, not quite a boom, but Bone ha- Bone came out. Bone is very popular. Issue one of Bone was in many printings and that, that uh, first printing of issue one was going for big money and it created a situation where stores started to look in that section of previews again, started picking things up. So you had comics like Stray Bullets coming out, Paul Pope's THB, Rob Schrab is doing Scudded Disposable Assassin. Uh, Rick Veach doing Roaring Rick's uh, Rare Bit Fiends. Steve Bissett's Tyrant. Col- Cerebus was part of that. It was the Spirits of Independence, and it ran around for a couple of years. Right, right. But, you know, that's the context. And same as you pick these babies up as they came out before we start like opening these up and uh you know discussing the individual issues what do we got here jim this is the uh first hardcover collection of the uh it's the innocence of nihilism volume one and it collects the first seven issues what we're going to kind of talk about and look at here today exactly but there's extra stuff in the back and so i thought this would be fun to look at first these are the writing of issue one that was done uh allegedly on the plane on the plane ride back from san diego that led to the story in issue one. This is the writing of that. So pretty cool to see this. We talk process a lot. Um, you know, it starts out with with a lot of images and kind of moves into more of the text, but still really great to see kind of the first draft of what issue one would, would be. I see something very interesting right here because the art style in Stray Bullets very different than... Uh, his approach on like say harbinger <laughs> right <laughs> yes. and i as i was like giving these a, a reread and we'll bust these open in a second uh david mazzucchelli came to mind yes and batman year one and i think that's catwoman from from year one so it's like at this point he's like making that decision 
probably um, Rubber Blanket is out and blowing everybody's mind. So, like, you know, that's kind of the direction our guy goes with this. Yeah, I have Mazzucchelli written in my notes is, is definitely somebody I spot in there. And, you know, Lapham is still young. I think he starts at Valiant probably in 91 or so. This is 1995. So still a very young artist, it's almost a savant in, in my mind in terms of how quickly and how great he develops. This does not look like the work of, a, of maybe three or four years into a career. Yeah, that that's that is truthful, man. And and just like just looking at these covers, it's an incredible choice. I love it. You know, super poppy top, you know, two thirds. Uh I feel like I feel like the composition of like the image being so squeezed here, I think it's probably proportional to the uh you know, pretty close to, you know, the eight panel grid size panel. Yeah, my first thought is uh, like film, like a film still. And, you know, this is a noir-influenced series, which has its roots in film in a lot of ways. And you'll see it several times as we go through here where lighting and composition, it really feels like a, a 1940s black-and-white crime movie in some of these stills. Um, you know, and I, I think that Lapham's a pretty well-known uh, fan of that material, and it comes through from covers to the individual panels. He makes a bunch of great design decisions. So the cover is, is step one, you know, trying to stand out on a wall of new comics. How do you stand out? Flat color is a pretty good way to do it. You, you need some confidence maybe to, to make that choice, but he nails it. And then the inside, for the most part, it's that eight panel grid. And, uh, and he talks about this in different places, interviews in the back, of the, uh, the back of that big hardcover book. He talks about some of these choices. And his thing is very quickly... The, uh, the panel borders sort of fall away and you're just locked in. And I, I love it. And it also works for somebody that's never read a comic. There's no confusion to how to read this eight panel grid. This is, this is comics for everybody, new readers and longtime readers. Yeah, he's very good. One of, one of his great skill sets as a writer, as a composer, is bringing you into the moment really fast, really quickly, like, like you are there. And just rereading these issues and beyond... Uh, with a little bit more of a critical eye, I um, I feel like I'm sort of understanding some of the process a little bit because uh, one of the things I think about with him is he's like he's like a great kind of set designer, like beyond your average cartoonist. And one of the things that he does is he creates maybe each issue there are like maybe two two settings. And like uh, an entire sequence, you know, 10 pages can go by with just characters sitting at like a picnic on a picnic blanket. Before you turn the page, I want to note 1997. Each of these stories will have the setting in the beginning and they bounce around. Like at one point I thought for talking about this, oh, we could arrange them in chronological order because they go from like the 70s to 1997. This is a future story. You know, this came out in 95. So at the time, this is two years in the future that this particular issue takes place. Kind of weird, weird detail. And, you know, this is, this is issue one. And I don't know that we pick things back up like in 1990. I think this is like the only you know, 90s story in this, in the original series. So, you know, it's Joey, he's, he's grown up. We're going to see young Joey right. a little bit later. The way that it was sold to me in, in, in Wizard uh, is not what it grew to be. Uh, the way it was sold early on, and I think what his early inspiration was, and, you know, we'll, we'll get him on the, the channel one day and, 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 and talk about it. But, um, the way it was sold early on was that it's single issues, uh, non-linear, and uh, introducing like new segments all the time. But pretty rapidly, probably after these seven issues, he falls in love with a couple of characters, and we start to we start to follow them along through through most of the journey. So what he was originally setting out to do isn't what it turned into, but nobody's complaining. For sure. Also, with the non-linear part of it, can't help but think that uh, Tarantino's Pulp Fiction... I was just going to say was, that. ...was a big inspiration for the storytelling and just the, the, the overall vibe. Because these are noir Pulp Fiction kind of characters that, that we're going to unpack here. Look, see, that's like a Mazzucchelli kind of stroke right there. there. There's a lot of beautiful black and white 
art throughout this. Uh, you know, you see these big brush strokes. Yeah, I mean, that, that looks like a Tarantino homage there. Um, the big brush strokes, the texture, the great lighting stuff. Um, you know, some of it, I see parallels with Mazzucchelli for sure from Batman Year One to Rubber Blanket. But also, like, you describe Mazzucchelli's work the same way as being these, like, really great with light and volume and atmosphere. So, you know, some parallels there. I'm sure he was conscious of Mazzucchelli's work at this time. You know, that was some of the best work in, in American comics in this era. So I'm sure there's some influence, but I, I think Lapham is just... It makes sense. This is where he's going. You know, even if you look at those early Harbingers to this point, you can see a certain evolutionary direction to this, especially with an emphasis on people. You know, like all these people, you could almost cast them as, as actors or people you know. Like, it, it's just all the little details add up well. He, I imagine, is something of a, of a graphomaniac. You know, um, Maria, his, his wife, would often, you know, when she gets enough of her you know, Popeye comic strips that he draws strictly for her. Yeah. Uh, she'll put them on Tumblr. So this guy's drawing all the time. And it makes me wonder about who he is as a person and as a writer, because these are very rich characters. But I associate most graphomaniacs. You know, we've been to enough comic conventions and we got to know enough people that the compulsive graphomaniac uh, ain't really one to talk to people, observe people, engage with people it makes me more curious about the creator here because the richness of some of these characters it makes me feel like he's had a life beyond the drawing board that's the truth notice as we as we're flipping through this everybody watching how many of these panels will show up that are just like almost standalone beautiful compositions on their own like frequently he nails that you know it's almost like part of its storytelling and then part of it are just these really beautiful great panels and a lot of variety in terms of um point of view perspective you know you'll get these long shots you'll get silhouettes it's a tour de force of cartooning in a lot of ways and the third part is the writing ed as, as you're saying like this does seem to be a guy who i don't i think this is his first written piece right and it's really a pleasure to read i was shocked whenever i went back through this and there are several pieces that i thought this would be a perfect as a web comic as a phone comic you know where it'd be like one panel at a time that you're scrolling through I was even going to shoot some of these sequences and put up. Like there was one that we just went through where the older guy, what, what has happened is they're disposing of a body and it just gets out of control. And pretty soon they have a dead cop. Joey's lost his mind. He's shooting people up whenever they stop the car anywhere. And so this try to quietly dispose of a body turns into a night that like they're just not going to be able to clean up. And in the process, the older guy, the more seasoned, you know, hitman type tells this story about, um, the uh the 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 lost shepherd the good shepherd so, some biblical story about a guy in their neighborhood that would go around and talk to all the pimps and the drug dealers to try to convert them to jesus and then he would kill them because that was saving their soul so shades of jack chick but it's about a six panel sequence where the guy tells this story and it's incredible he's driving and he's telling this story and i thought he was setting up that he was going to kill joey is where i thought that was going but just as like you know these scenes within scenes these little set pieces they really hit. It's very easy to read this thing. Um, at some point, we're going to compare this to, to Frank Miller's Sin City, another 90s popular crime comic. From a reading experience, I find this to be a more enjoyable short story than most of the Sin City stories. These are these are less archetypes and more character, right. where the Sin City stuff is much more the archetype and less of the observed character. Right. The, uh, the story ends here with, with Joey... Um, going after Harry. And Harry is a name that's mentioned regularly. And if this is a 1997 story, when we launch into these old issues, you know, the, the subsequent issues from the early 80s, Harry's name is mentioned a lot. So he's like one of those guys that you have in your neighborhood that just will not die. He's, he's, he's incessant. Before you start flipping through this, Ed, I want to say something. This is 1995. This is 2002. This is one of the first free comic book day years. And so Lapham packaged this issue, one of his favorites, I assume, you know, if you're going to pick not number one to promote. And it was on the uh, a double bill with the Matrix comics. And the reason I wanted to pull this out, I got it at Phantom of the Attic in Monroeville. Read more comics. Oh, 2002. Yeah, <laughs> so pretty cool. And, and probably a great exposure to a lot of readers of this. Uh, this is an amazing story, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. So... 
1997 issue one. Let's go back 20 years, man, and uh, introduce a Spanish Spanish Scott. Uh, one of Harry's heavies. Yes. And uh, he's going to do away with the guy in the line of sight of young Virginia Applejack, who is like everybody's favorite character in uh, Stray Bullets, right? Yeah, really amazing. No, Okay, so a thing to note as we flip through this issue, these characters are always moving, crouching. They're never in a static, like upright, stiff pose. They're always moving around. And I wonder if that's a Jim Shooter thing because uh, Lapham talks about Jim Shooter being his first mentor. You know, he worked with him at Valley and he worked with him at Defiant before he comes here. And Shooter had a lot of ideas on how to make comics, but that would be one of those. Is like the characters aren't stiff, they aren't static, they're always doing something, and it creates life. And you're going to see it in here, and especially with Virginia Applejack, because a little kid body language totally different than like a like a 35 year old hard smoke and hard living uh, Spanish Scott. Very pivotal moment in young uh, Virginia Applejack's life. She just witnessed a murder. And this is going to color... Two murders. Yeah. This, Two murders. <laughs> this is going to color uh, the rest of her life. It does. It changes her, her entire trajectory. You know, she just came out of seeing Star Wars and was a very imaginative, super inspired, happy-go-lucky young girl. And then this is what she becomes after, you know, 10 minutes of from leaving the flick. Yeah, and, and nobody, her sister is supposed to be watching her and kind of, you know, is off fooling around with her boyfriend and not paying attention. And her answer is, don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> right, yeah. Also got the introduction of probably one of the most wholesome, lovable characters, if, by my lights in, in, in Stray Bullets, uh, Virginia's dad, who Lapham is a sadist because he, he makes us love him. I was going to say, man, <laughs> that, that, that being the most lovable guy... That's not going to finish. <laughs> not going to serve you well in this world. This right here is like uh, Windsor McKay type storytelling right here. You know, keep keep the fixed camera view, characters in full figure. Yeah, little bits of body language as they kind of move, talk, interact, jab at each other with verbally. And it works as like a Sunday page kind of, you know, has its, its, its satisfying punchline. There are tons of these sequences where it'll just be like three panels in the middle of the page and they're just fantastic. They could be a comic strip. So, so Ginny is, uh, she's, she's one of those kids now, man. She's, she's, she's damaged and all the kids like sharks, sharks with chum, like they, they know it. That's the animal kingdom, man. Yeah. That is the animal kingdom. They spot that weakness and now you're ostracized, you are targeted, you're bullied. And that's what we're seeing with her. Yeah. So kids have a birthday party and, uh, decide to skip, skip her over. Teacher gets mad. They they're forced to giving her a cupcake, and some uh, you know some bully guy licks the cupcake, puts it down. Kevin, and she's got a <laughs> she's she's got to take care of business, man. Yeah, she stands up for herself and uh, nearly stabs him in the lung <laughs> with a pencil. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but uh, <laughs> it's just a comic. <laughs> yeah, the parents come to school. They're having trouble. They don't know anything that, that has happened, really, in terms of her witnessing this murder. They, they notice maybe some of her behaviors have changed. Same with the, the teacher and principal, but it's just, what do you do? The mom and dad really treat her differently. We have uh, shades of Amy Racecar stories. This is really cool stuff. In, in yeah. issue two, we have some good uh, visual comedy because also, uh, after Virginia stabbed that boy, she done bit, <laughs> bit the teacher's thumb off. <laughs> And of course, the mom is one of those uh, cold fish, man. She, she doesn't quite get along with her daughter so well. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, it's almost more, the, the mother's almost more of the bully now at home. Right. Yeah, little Ginny can't, can't escape it. And then we build to just like the relationship that dad and daughter have. And like, you know, when you see this stuff and it's like the first smile she's had on her face since she left Star Wars. You know, how well does Lapham draw these people to be able to do like this variety of characters and including the kids? It's so hard to draw kids. We have pointed out so many examples of cartoonists drawing kids that look scary because they can't draw kids because the proportions are different. The faces are different. He nails it, man. He makes it look easy. Great haircuts. Just great character designs overall, man. And, and uh, I would say an iconic Halloween costume. 
this is great. What a story. Yeah. And she just, she looks so vulnerable as, you know, her big sis is kind of like, you know, get, getting her ready to go. Lapham, once again, as great sort of set designer, he creates like these perfect neighborhoods that, that Phil lived in and, and, uh. Yeah, great porch setting and it's one panel it's not like the guy's making a, uh, a a whole scene a whole piece there it's like no that's one eighth of a page and this is this is practical work this isn't a guy building it in google sketch so that he has a million angles that he can light box later like this is a dude taping his boards down and rolling out perspective grids to, to make that stuff happen so the sisters uh She's heading off to the van with the boyfriend and, and leaving Jenny on her own. And into the darkness, she goes by herself on Halloween night. Yes, sir. And then we have the reconnaissance mission with what, what's his name? <laughs> Kevin? Kevin. Kevin and the crew. And that's like, you know, iconic devil mask. Uh, you know, they're they're on a mission. They're sneaking around. It's they're, payback time. They're going to they're going to ambush the girl. When they jump out, you know, she's still an imaginative kid. This is this is the future Amy race car. So when she sees the son of Satan coming after her, <laughs> only thing, you know, fight or flight or freeze, she decides flight is is the, the best option. But then, you know, one of the bone dudes from the first Karate Kid pops out from behind a tree and uh, Sergeant Rock follows suit. It ain't going to end well, man. No, and, and Lapham doesn't mess around. With the, uh, this goes on for 10 minutes. It's, yeah. it's three three of these kids just kicking the shit out of her. Yeah, great images. I think what you showed us with the, the notebook um, script and composing these super tiny panels to go along, I think that goes a long way. Like when you design those super small panels, because clarity is a premium at that very small size. And, you know, if you have the balls to translate those thumbnails to the bigger boards uh it should remain clear and after pounding on her for 10 minutes they introduce a knife yeah take off the take off the mask but it kind of it kind of uh rubs against her face you know cut cuts her a bit and she she freaks the fuck out this is where it's like it's such a schmoz that you can't even exactly see what's going on yeah it gets out of control and there is a sense when I read this of the kids panicking too, like, okay, we're, what do we do? And eventually they bash her in the head with a rock a couple times and break the gun, you know, the toy gun over her head. It, it's, this is not a fun story. Like this is super dark. She's left laying in the woods, not moving face down, bleeding from her face. Dude. I mean, when you read this at the time, I thought she was dead. I thought it was over. Like, oh man, they killed that girl. Yeah. You know, I read issue one and it, similar note, you know, so it's like for all intents and purposes, this is a dead kid and uh, they never kill a kid in pop culture. Yeah. This whole story, you're not going to see in too many, uh, too many movies <laughs> or TV shows. And then this is, this is chilling. <laughs> <laughs> and he even says, don't ask. Right. <laughs> Let's not bury the lead. <laughs> What a great cover, right? It all works. Like, I, I have to imagine that he composed a still life for drawing Prob this thing. Then. Probably. Well, Very accurate bottles. It would make sense, but also his ability to seemingly draw anything. I don't know, man. He might not have to. I would have composed a still life for that. Right. <laughs> now, this issue to me is when Lapham really starts to get into a rhythm with that eight panel grid. And it is on display at this very beginning chase sequence where we have our dudes running from the cops. I think maybe a little more of that Tarantino inspiration. Very Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. And we got our dudes going, you know, separate ways. Got to pick up the, the diamonds or whatever the fuck. And there's just like great stuff here as he's running from the cops, cop pulls, shoots. And there's like the Keystone cops. Like you feel the skid right there. <laughs> and, then, and then the dude just dips. And then, you know, point of view from the trash can as the portly dude, you know, runs closer, like, like that sense of urgency. And then, right. You know, he just dips, dips off, heads to the out, like it's a, and then they reconvene. One of the hardest things to do is something like a chase scene and keep, keep your geography making sense. Yes. 
all those things when they tell you like, oh, draw this for your submission pages. This is the kind of stuff you should be tasked with because it is really <laughs> hard to do. So the boys, uh, you know, they they pulled some some mission. They had to steal a car to get the hell out of there. They shot a guy in the shoulder. But their, uh, you know, self-delusion is a, is a great, you know, tool of uh, self-preservation. And he's like, oh, you know, I just shot him in the shoulder or whatever. The guy has like four or five bullet wounds and is definitely toast. I think he blame, they blame the cops for shooting the, that guy for actually finishing him off. But it doesn't change what happens here because like we're going to follow these guys like they didn't just kill a father right. just turn the page there's uh there's more in the car than just that dead dead old man there's a baby in the back of the, of the car that right. they just leave you know screaming and crying with with the dead dad in the front seat yeah tell the old bag lady hey man there's a present back there for you <laughs> yeah these but these not, are be not before lifting his wallet scummy characters yes yeah <laughs> And look at that bubble vest, man, that 1980s bubble vest. Yeah, very back to the future. Mar Marty McFly there counting the money out of the dead man's wallet. And guess what? There's 300 bucks. Let's have a party. Yeah. And here's where we've got to see some 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 characters that we've been introduced to before and we'll explore uh, again in the future. We see Spanish Scott. You know, this is this is a early story. Issue 1 is 1997. This is like 1980. 1980. Yeah, so there's young Joey. Now we have some idea about how old he is in uh is issue one of uh, stray bullets there and in issue one part of joey's unraveling is based on he the dead body is a is a hooker yeah and uh he had had sex with that hooker and apparently it's the first time he's had sex and he's in love with her in his head uh, we get to see some of the some of his own damage accruing in this story and, and how that might con those two things might connect yeah because because this is his mommy right here man and uh she's she's kind of a hoe She's yeah. a fast woman, we'll say. I always loved like this feels like Frank Miller to me, like the way he's holding that that beer bottle, you know, like that's that's Batman him and Robin, his <laughs> first his first butt. <laughs> Monster's first appearance. Yeah, yeah. Like Lapham is fi starting to figure out his uh his dialogue balloon, we'll say. And he's one of those scary guys who looks like a big nerd, but has a dark side and and this this actually that kind of character spoke to me a lot like around this time because say a few years before this uh is when the hardest dudes in the neighborhood have binkies in their mouths and like pacifiers so it's big strong dudes with tank tops and huge muscles and they got a binky in their mouth and i'm just like scared to death <laughs> of these motherfuckers <laughs> yeah and this page itself so we see all kinds of characters that will be part of Stray Bullets moving forward. Beth, Nina, Monster, and Spanish Scott are all characters we'll see again and again. But introduced, you know, kind of low-key here. Right, yeah. And once again, I still think it's like he's he's got those intentions of doing these sort of one-and-done stories that fit into, like, a bigger universe. Uh, but he's going to be falling in love with some of these characters very rapidly. Does hair really well. If you notice her hair as we go through, you know, it's it's very natural. Hair can be hard to draw. For sure, man. He's he's a brush slinger, man. His lettering is getting really on point too. You know, he's he's growing a lot. Like if you take a look at the lettering in, in issue one, it's 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 serviceable, but it's uh it's loose. Yeah, and that's something that's one of those choices he makes early on that he wants to letter this himself. You know, yeah. like this is his book and he wants to do it all. And and by the way, people, he was putting these babies out uh, pretty reliably every two months. I was going to say, we're going to look at seven issues here, and it's going to cover, you know, 14 months. So, damn. You know, launching the book and being able to maintain that schedule. And and, and quality. Very you know? impressive. Yeah, this is where his, his wife is woven into the fold to handle a, a lot of the duties. And, you know, we talked about it before. Like, like you, you, need, that, you need that partner. You know, like, Bone would have been far more of a cottage industry if it wasn't for Vijaya helping uh, Jeff sure. do his thing, man, in an administrative capacity. So we have Beth and Nina. Uh, Nina, it was uh, Harry's Harry's girlfriend, and she's feeling all salty and morose. Uh, but she's also fairly square, too, you know? Like, I mean, these are girls, these are tough girls who, who are attracted to, to those, you know, bad boys and stuff. But they're still, you know, they're still kids, kind of. And Beth is pushing Nina on another boy, trying to get her to quit thinking about uh, Harry. 
But here's the problem, man. Spanish Scott is Harry's right hand man, you know, so she can't be uh, fraternized. You know, it's it's Mia Wallace, right? You know, with with that guy who got dangled out of the, hmm. you know, the the off camera death or whatever from the guy who gave her a foot massage. <laughs> like that's 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 this guy right here. Get to see a little bit of Beth here whenever a neighbor is complaining that the party's uh, out of hand. Spanish Scott's ready to go shut the neighbor down, and Beth is like, no, 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 I'll take care of it, thinking Spanish Scott might go just slit her throat or something. Beth, uh, Beth is just as terrifying. Rips her phones off the wall, throw them out the window, threatens her. This, this was the era... Dude, I was, like, toward the end of middle school here, and my middle school was separated from the high school by a football field. And we had to go into the high school for like home ec class and like a wood shop class. And we had to be trusted to go from, to walk from the middle school to the high school. And when we would do that as a class, um, it was only, I never knew dudes that smoked cigarettes. I knew all girls that smoked cigarettes. And it would be like, this girl Amber would just like start lighting up and stuff. And, and they were just, such tough chicks and that's who like these <laughs> yes. girls remind me of that like it's very true just like real fast definitely dating old ass dudes that probably ain't even are beyond high school you know but that's who these girls are to me it, it, because it was in tandem with what i was li the experience i was living and and that's one of the attractions because i'm like lapham like oh he, he knows he remembers he knows this these shit. characters and they are very distinct from one another you know Nina versus this, I forget his name, Led, I think. Because he don't matter. <laughs> he doesn't. But, I mean, totally different personalities. I was going to point out this panel that I think is so interesting. You just see the tops of their heads, but you see their shadows walking on the walls. Again, that noir kind of shadows and lighting. And just these crazy textures. Like, like, like what, like what is, the, you know, that's just grit of, like, the alleyway. And I don't know about you. I wouldn't have the balls to try that. But he did, and it, and it works great. He does a lot of these panels that are, you know, a person's half cropped off the panel and stuff. It's uh it's it's a lot of strong choices. He's showing off for the girl, you know, like he left his wallet back home, so so he's gonna, you know, rob some beer. With her pantyhose on his head. Yeah. It's this whole uh first date, it's the perfect crime fiction first first date kind of thing. <laughs> and uh here here's one of those early you know, there's like the homicidal triad or whatever of like, you know, future serial killers. And the sexual component involving a parent uh, is often a part of the the so here's little pathology. Joe, little sensitive, impressionable Joey opens the door and just and to to see these oafs, you know, two guys, yeah, <laughs> with with his moms. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. And even this shit with the little kid at the party, I've I've seen that. Yeah, you know, I've fucking seen that shit before. Oh. Yeah, and it is a tragic character, the kid at the party of a bunch of adults doing drugs everywhere. Yes, sir. It's the perfect thing of being a terrible thing to see without any on-screen violence, over-the-top anything. It's just the ugly, sad, damaging scene. You need Amy Racecar when, when you do enough of these kind of issues. You know what I'm saying, man? So we just saw the mom getting uh, finger-cuffed by a couple of dudes and she's trying to you know she's trying to make time with with our, our lead fella who was part of that early robbery man but he's not really like you know she's she's like long in the tooth you know she's like the old lady at the party um yeah have, having some regrets about choices she's made over the years but still being flirty well it's enough to make him think i gotta make a move on this girl that i'm that i'm robbing liquor stores with yeah this is special you gotta act on it <laughs> learn from rose and andy does and i i would this is a great sex scene right here you know nothing gratuitous great angles he does a few of these kind of panels where there's just a little bit of light in them yeah it breaks up the page so well. Makes you know? me think of you know that that's like Jaime. You know he's he's got yes. this, this Jaime energy. By the way, Jaime Hernandez written down as my uh, list of influences here. Very so. very few people really understand black and white, and you know the, all basically all the names that have come up in our conversation today are are, are those people, and, and Lapham fits in there uh, somewhere. They consummate their new relationship. They're they're glowing in the moment. They're talking about like let's you know the fantasizing. Let's go run away. She's saying we got let's let's just go. Let's just drop everything and get out of here. Yeah. Because she knows something he doesn't. 
Yes. She's it, involved with uh, the that, most dangerous person in Stray Bullets. Yes. You know, she is. She is Harry's girlfriend. He Finally, he's convinced. Yeah, let's let's get out of here. But not before, you know, his homeboy comes by. Dude, you got to come out here. Harry's here. He wants to meet you. He's super stoked. And if you make good with Harry, like your mantle is sealed. Everybody fears you. You're going to be making money. Shit's going to be fly. Uh, but she knows... She knows what's going to happen. We know, too, because we saw Stray Bullets number two, and the, one of the guys Spanish Scott kills is because he uh, he wasn't straight with Harry. Yes, sir. Yeah, this this poor sucker's fate is sealed. Yes. He doesn't know it yet, but we all do. So so she becomes, and, and I think we'll see it within these seven issues, but she is like Izzy Rubens from, from Love and Rockets or something. Like, this is the most cogent we're going to see her, and then she and then she's toast. What you see? Real quick, I, I just want to point out, we, we talked about, you know, the uh, Spirits of Independence tour and stuff. That's what this is. So this is um, not an SPX, but you see it's branded as Spirits of Independence. So this was a show, I think, in Vermont or New Hampshire that they were going to, you know, in pretty bad typesetting. <laughs> Hard to read some of these names. But if you do read them, it's people like Drew Hayes from Poison Elves, Steve Bissett Tyrant, you know, we mentioned. So it's these uh, kind of the who's who, the second wave, as you said, of black and white uh, self-publishers. This is one of the ones like when when Tom Palmer Jr. did his did his uh, Palmer's picks on this. This is one of the ones that that he kind of uh, talked about a lot. This is a beautiful issue. Look at this man. Cover colors Janet Jackson, another uh, another person from uh, Valiant Comics. Yeah, she colors the first four covers, and then Lapham's going to take over coloring, but with somebody at first to kind of like work out how to do it. And uh, this issue, Bonnie and Clyde. So obviously, we talk about his love of, of you know these crime, these crime movies and stories. Um, never far from his heart, I don't think. K Favors, I'm very happy to report to you that Virginia Applejack is still alive. Yes, she and survived it, Halloween night. And this is she, but she's got a little bit of gimmick on her face, man. She's got the uh, they, they call that the buck fifty, man, because it takes 150 stitches to uh, to sew up. And uh, she's running away from home. We established that her mom is a douchebag and her dad is a truck driver who's not home very often. So she has to, those those warring personalities, unstoppable force, immovable object. They can't get along. So she's dipping and uh, gets picked up by a guy who's seemingly a reasonable adult who's just kind of <laughs> like, hey, little girl, like, like, where are you from? Like, we need to take you back home. Like that, like that sort of fella. Sees that hand come come near her face and she freaks the fuck out, runs away, and then we have uh, her. This this is like, you know, her imaginative personality kind of on display. Yeah, the second time we've seen it. You know, the first time was with the written notes that the principal had of her violent fiction writing in in class. Uh, and so here we see the the daydream of the giant insect eating her. Just in time for. This this unknown vacuum cleaner salesman perhaps c happens upon her. Maybe he's a televangelist. This is a great story because yeah. it does take some turns. Yes, hops in the car with with uh, with this guy, and they're they're gonna plan on uh, you know robbing banks, run, running away, being uh, criminal masterminds together. And, uh, uh, Bonnie and Clyde too. Yes, and you uh, very quickly get some sense like when you get this like lingering handshake with a giant hand small in her small digits the gaze this shot kind of tells you everything and then let's let's sell it let's sell it with a little tongue yeah i wonder how much of this is what's being sold and how much of it is set up for a swerve because he certainly it feels like this guy's inappropriate yeah you don't say right Right. <laughs> and he's talking about the guns he has and all the banks he robs <laughs> and, and how he's he's got a gun in the dashboard. And she's so stoked. She's yeah. like, oh, man, I'm going to check it out. And he's like, hold up. It's protected by fire ants and C4 explo explosives and stuff like that. Cool beans is a running uh, word, that phrase that's used in the, the series quite often. Yeah. So he gains her trust with this whole talk of robbing banks and stuff and gets her real name out of her. Pretty Pretty quick, pretty effective. He's a smooth talker. Yes. Silver tongue, this guy. I love this sequence. This is just the car driving down the road. 
I don't even know why it's in there. It's probably partially her fantasies of like, this is going really great. You know, like some of the storytelling does feel like it's from her point of view. The stuff where it's like, is he being inappropriate? Is he making passes? What are we seeing? Like whose interpretation of this are we seeing? And whenever you see this, like clearly there's some kind of like, we're in somebody's headspace. Yeah. But man, it looks good. Again, it looks good. It's these eight pages. Like how do you make these eight panels exciting, different variety, still tell the story, read smoothly, be clear. That's a lot to juggle. <laughs> this is such a great piece of it. Do you kill lots of people? No. Scowl. <laughs> <laughs> Only the ones who deserve it. Smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a little psycho. Yeah, that's your four panel comic strip, you know, yeah. couched within. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a little a little twisted peanuts version right there. <laughs> um you know, and they're they're planning the escape route, like, okay, we're gonna take you here, we're gonna take you there, like we'll take you far away from where you came from. And he's taking her to get some grub. Vegas is something that they're agreeing to. He's he's plying her with all the treats and and uh bullshit that, you know, keep her pacified. And then we get those close-ups. Right. And I can't help but think that that's his POV. Yeah, he is, he's too nice. He's perfect. He's sort of this fantasy for her of like, oh, we'll go to Vegas. We'll be with the gangsters. You know, it's all just whatever she wants to hear the, is what he's saying. And there is, there is passive grooming talk too, you know, like he'll mention sex and he'll mention stuff like that, man. And, you know. Yeah, they're going to a motel uh, once they... I think they're going to rob a little gas station first, and then they'll, they'll go find a motel. Right. Yeah, it's really... Uh, again, it's... I You know, we're going to we're gonna reveal a little bit of a swerve, but it is such a creepy, like, build-up. Like, what... Halfway through this story, it's like, what are we reading? <laughs> right. How is this going to end? The last one was her, we thought, dead in the woods, beaten to death. What's going to happen here? I'm going to be honest with you, too. At, at, when I was reading these these babies as they came out uh you know six months past before issue two or whatever four months i didn't even register this girl as as the other girl you know it was like upon reading all the stuff together where i was like oh right. shit it's the same it's the same person um this is something that he does really well so it's nighttime we've, we've been in the car all day it's gotten dark and you know it in this black and white comic you instantly know that setting great like fall trees there with using like white uh white paint yeah northeast everything's dead so he uh tasks the girl with writing the 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 ransom note or whatever <laughs> the the the, the stick-up notice and you know he pops out there and and you know he's he's a square he's just buying shit like like you could you could tell in the storytelling i love this sequence so he gives her they, they come up with a code that she's gonna beep the horn if like a, a copper shows up or whatever yes and you know she's Idle hands are the devil's something or other. She's very curious about that that gun. Uh, but thankfully, there's like a little cicada or something. Man, this two-page sequence of her dipping in and out of the shadows, trying to see what's happening, getting the reflection of the of the state trooper walking, walking into the store, and her reaction. What a panel that is, man. Talk about hard to draw. If you saw that in a script, I would just panic. <laughs> yeah, like... Thankfully, the writer artist has something in mind uh, when putting the stuff together, man. And we see our uh, our creeper with you know one of those Smokey Smokey the Bear uh, state trooper characters having a little conversation, a little joking. Sends him on his way, and uh, and they're off, man. And this guy's such a sick fuck. He puts a bunch of his money from his wallet, like in a paper bag, to give to her to like to keep the <laughs> to keep the story going. Gives her a cigarette. Which she loves, by the way. <laughs> she is a troubled kid. It's it's so sad. And see, this is like the grooming talk. You know, I don't normally subscribe to smoking myself, but sometimes after jobs and after sex is my motto, you know? And then we got the, you know, the touching. It's very creepy stuff. Hand on the face. Uh, contrast with what we saw on, like, page two, where the guy tries to touch her and she recoils. Good storytelling. At this point, you know, she's made a connection with this guy over the course of the issue. Right. And, uh, you know, like, she's she's out cold. Uh, he is taking her right back. Like, she, she knows where she is, basically, when she wakes when she, up. When she wakes up. She knows where she is, 
and uh, you know opens up the glove box. No gun. No gun. Full of political pins. Barrow for Congress. Oh man, what a scumbag! <laughs> <It's> almost, <laughs> he'd almost be less of a scumbag if he was doing anything else. If he if he was a, a serial killer, he might be less of a scumbag than what he's done. <laughs> you know, he, he's just making political hay off of uh, taking her home. Obviously, put in a call probably at that convenience store to make sure all the news people would be there to see him rescuing this uh, young underage runaway. Yep. Incredible. Great story. Super great. Really great story. <laughs> and you had options at this moment to send your fan letters in to uh, Dave Lapham because there was the uh, the P.O. box right there. But look at that email address right there, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty early, man. That's, Those that's, were the uh, days, baby. Possibly still 95, maybe 96. but Those were the days. And he's getting good feedback. Um, you know, I think this... I think this Comic did well for, for a while. Yes, sir. Probably whenever it starts to struggle is, I bet you, with distribution stuff. Because some of these letter columns, they'll start to run distribution notes. And then, of course, we you know we know what happens in the mid to late 90s when all the distributors collapse. That's what really screws up the spirits of independence. A lot of those people, that was it for them. You know, right. self-publishers. And uh, Lapham persists on, but... I'm sure there were some tough times. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, what happens when a distributor goes away and they default on all of their business they, and, and, you know, they declare bankruptcy it means they don't have to pay you. Right. But you, you did pay the printer for the books yeah. and the shipping. And... Yeah, it's a nightmare. <clears throat> and it, and it's a, I don't know about you, Jimmy. It's kind of a constant thought in my mind. Like, certainly whenever, say, Hip Hop Family Tree came out, there were thoughts in, in the back of my mind. Like, in fact, like, you know, Fantagraphics, they did their Kickstarter around then. And I'm like, I have a hit comic book. I'm living in poverty. The worst thing that could ever happen is some sort of bankruptcy kind of thing happens. It didn't, and things are all good. But that was a possibility because as a fan, I lived through witnessing these various issues that, that these cartoonists when had When I started with. making comics, I knew guys who would have several books and they would put them strategically with a different publisher because if one publisher goes out of business, you're not ruined. Right. Let's introduce everybody to uh, to Orson and one of the running themes uh, that, you know, I guess if it happens two times, it's a runner. And uh, this time, Spanish Scott is killing another guy. I thought you were going to go with the innocence part because Orson is, is very innocent. High school uh, valedictorian type. Yeah, and you could tell by his goddamn haircut, man. <laughs> That or the brother from No Country for Old Men. <laughs> right. Uh, once again, just just great setting. All peripheral characters look look interesting. Pink Floyd shirt, man. Great setups with just images. You know, you see a handful of drugs spilled by the guy that was run over and a phone number written on the hand and a gun butt sticking out. Like, it's it's everything you need in three images. I think this is Akira homage because, like, there's the pills and, like, when Akira was laying down, you saw the 28 on the hand. I think you're in, right. In, in that same setting. Good call. Um, reintroducing... Rose. Joey's mom. Yep. And... Uh, you know, she's one of those hard ladies, you know, those city city living chicks, man. It's like, oh, an another dead body must be Wednesday. Uh, but this kid is definitely flummoxed and, you know, hormonal. Hormonal. But she's strategic. She knows what she's doing. You know, she she pushes up front and pops pops that booty out. Do you think that she's working him at this point in the... We're going to go through this whole issue, so I'm not giving anything away. We're yeah. going to see connections between Spanish Scott and Rose. Yeah. Um, do you think that's what's happening in this scene? Is that how I, we're I, supposed to interpret this? For sure. I, I don't, but I don't think it. I don't think it has to do with Spanish Scott or anything. I think she's just she she recognizes a mark. You know, like this this kid is clearly a peckerwood. You know, so she could she's going to be able to get something out of him. Man, so they go for lunch, you know, some, some, first some talk, some, as you say, you know, working him and takes him to lunch. Pretty soon she's given him the cigarette and the alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> only, everybody's a bad influence in this book. Only 17, you know, like, I don't, I don't even know how that shit worked back in those days, man. Like, could a 17 year old smoke and, and what, was that legal? I, I don't know. I have a feeling Rose knows the places to go where uh, you can do anything. Right. Yeah. And certain ply kids with the alcohol and that sort of thing um 
and we're, and we're getting, you know, the, the set. We're building his character as being, you know, just like an academic mathlete, perhaps. But he's definitely nervous and freaked out also about just like the, the crazy stuff that he witnessed. Yeah, and fun, fun drawings for that kind of thing. Like a guy that's really... What a day he's had. <laughs> a drink, a cigarette, a dead body, a girl talking to him, man. <laughs> His eyes are just glazed over. You see what I mean, though, about how, like, there are, like, very, like, a very, very few settings in each issue, and it's like Lapham kind of designs those environments very strategically and specifically and adorns them with, like, all the necessary stuff to kind of sell the moment. Character is a setting, right? Yes, sir. See, that's kind of like, that has Love and Rockets vibe to it. There's a lot of it, man. I, like I said, I, I made a note about it too, and I think we're going to see it more and more as we go through these issues. I think it becomes more pronounced, and why wouldn't it? If you're doing a black and white indie comic in the eight-panel grid, you see some of those in uh, in Love and Rockets. Orson makes his way home, and uh, the, the sister, presumably older sister, man, is having, having an argument with the folks, and just great, great body language here. Like, like, you could get that, like, prissy, welcome... You could hear that. Yeah. I feel like it should be like, face. welcome home, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the good child, you know? Like, he's he's the he's the pushover, the middle child syndrome or whatever, man. Like, he's there to please. And he had plans, you know? He wanted to go hang out with that old cougar. You know, he's thinking about it. <laughs> he's thinking about kicking it with her. Uh, but the parents have other plans, you know, like the bad, the bad big sister. She's, she's, she already said she isn't going to be around grandma and grandpa whenever they come visiting from Florida. So, you, so, so Orson has to, and he does. And he misses the party. Yes. Rose is not happy about it. Yeah. And you know, she's, she's working more angles and making him feel like a real piece of crap. And he's crying like a little wuss. Yeah. He's in over his head <laughs> very clearly. Again, good use of black to show atmosphere, to show that it's nighttime. Great lettering. And then whenever you go to an all-white panel, it has impact. You know, look, look at this two-page spread. What stands out? The one white panel. He's trying to make good, good with her. And he's going to uh, he's going to extremes in his. I believe the the the, the fashionable word now is uh, he's a simp. He's what they call a simp. Yeah, we're gonna get to see a little bit of monster in action. He he bought he bought uh, roses for Rose. This is such a good way to uh, give us a little monster characterization by establishing Orson as a simp, as a kid, as as this meek little innocent. And then what's that like? Let's let's show some contrast. <laughs> and they're talking some hairy shit, man, at Rose's place. Uh, Harry meaning Harry the guy, and Harry as in scary bad behavior. Yeah, killers. So Monster's like, what the fuck? This little peckerwood, what the hell did you hear? And starts roughing him up real good. But Rose comes to the rescue. Uh, is like, yo, he's here. Like, like you know, this party's for him. It's his birthday. Yeah, and he's a mess, man. He's he, Once again, the water works. <laughs> Although, to be fair, if Monster grabbed me and threw me against the wall, I'm sure uh, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be pissing my pants too. <laughs> now we enter party. We enter Rose's house. And her place as setting is awesome. Part Frank Miller, part Love and Rockets. Again, it's the black and white. If you're doing black and white art, it's a short list that you're going to be compared to. We haven't mentioned Toth yet, um, but you know, I feel like some of the silhouettes and things, you'll see shades of Toth in some of that stuff, even with some of the hands that are drawn so well. Yeah. We got this stuff. It's like pants <laughs> around the legs, hand on the dick, lighting a <laughs> cigarette too. There's a lot. There, I'm not sure that silhouette totally works right. Like, I don't... Some of the, the right. heads are coming out of odd spots, but drugs are being consumed, sex is being done. And look at that, this poppers, is quite, man. Quite the uh, party. That's how you know it's an old party, man, because they're doing they're doing poppers. <laughs> Boom, and just pages of Caligula. Yeah, do you think this is a Xerox? Uh, you know, move move your image on a Xerox machine. Might be. Yeah, I think, I think you got it. I bet you because he is so inventive, it feels like if you had this idea and you wanted to show somebody really in that like distorted point of view, why not try the, try the Xerox machine? Yeah. Lettering on point. Great cropping too. The 
you know, no sense of what, no bearings exactly, just pieces, fragments. <laughs> and Orson Man, he can't hold, he can't handle his high, <laughs> so he's just being all, uh, all, um, you know, overly lovey dovey. Boom! Two more pages of the craziness. These are great pages. And and look and look at this stuff though, man. Like re like repeating imagery. It's like probably boobs, <laughs> uh, Orson eyes, other guys' eyes. You know more eye, but like different versions of all that. And then this is like Even understanding like an em comics emoji. To yeah, for sure. But like understanding comics, like line as emotion kind right. of stuff happening. Boom. And then, uh, you know, everybody conks out. Look at that, man. A guy laying on the floor or a lady laying on the floor and the panel sideways. Um, yeah, the aftermath then... of this party is, it's on point. It's so disgusting and horrible. And you could feel it. So it's like, it, this is the same image, but now we just, we can see little Joey. Mm -hmm. And that's like, there was that one episode of Breaking Bad where, where uh, Pinkman has to go to the Crystal Meth Head's house. And there's like that little boy that lives there. And squalor, like that's that's what we got right here, man. And Orson wakes his ass up, but it's like it's like he's a different person now, you know. It's like he grew up a lot in twenty four hours. And even that thing that I called an emoji, we see that it has some root in the real world of Joey drawn on the wall with his crayons. Everything fits together really well. Yeah. So for the moment. Orson lost his simpness for, for this old lady. And he's bouncing. Yeah, don't call me, I'll call you. Dips out. And here we see Beth again, man. She was in the the one party with uh with Nina and those those uh those those fat boys that were robbing robbing people. So we hear a big kerfuffle, we hear some noise, we hear some screams, we see her say fuck. She's clearly she sees something. And uh, this lady hit a dude with the car. She's inconsolable. So what does Orson do? He runs up, punches her in the face. He's had enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this has been an overwhelming issue for poor Orson. This this was one of the ones like like I didn't have like enough of an emotional range as like a teenager. Where this was lost on me. I, yeah, I don't know if you could as a, you know, like it's hard to imagine this story if you're younger, you know, if you're, I, I don't know what age where this would start to make sense, but at a certain age, it makes a lot of sense. This sequence, this page where I was like, why would he do something like that? Just that feeling, man, of being just emotionally at the end. Right. And just like, doesn't know. Maybe it makes deal. the most sense now where everybody is living this way. There's the note from Maria in regards to um, distribution and trying to make sure whoever wants the book can find the book and even recommending, I think she recommends Cold Cut, which no longer a distributor today, but at the time handled a lot of indie books. Right. Um, I think whenever they went under, that was that was a bad one for everybody, you know, all the self-publishers and stuff, but uh, pointing out, you know, how people can find the book because, man, you know this, p people hit you up and say the store doesn't have it or they say they can't get it and it's like... It's the most frustrating thing in the world when somebody wants your book and they can't seem to be able to get, get their hands on it. Let's launch into uh, Amy Racecar. I hated Amy Racecar most of the time. When I reread this, it might be my favorite issue of this reread. First thing to note, it's Superman's origin. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, she's, she's on a rocket ship escaping from an exploding planet, the last of her kind. And then we launch into Grant Morrison's last issue of uh, Animal Man. Right. <laughs> Where she's she's chatting with God, and it just so happens to look like Dave Lapham. This feels like the biggest uh, experimental issue so far. We're going to see some some real... You know, well, one, you know, we haven't seen this art style yet. And yeah. it's not a whole issue. This is just this one scene. That sequence, yeah. But we're going to see things of, of typography being used differently, headlines, storytelling that takes big gaps, uh, big jumps, you know, between panels and scenes. Uh, because we're covering a, I don't know, a decade or so of time here. Jimmy, we just went through an emotional roller coaster with these issues. And... Uh, you know, we were able to read these things, 15 minutes an issue maybe, 
Uh, Dave Lapham had to live with each of these issues in production for two months apiece. Yeah, it's a year. There's, there's a year of life there. Let's uh, let's have some fucking fun. <laughs> let's 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 recharge our batteries. Let's create Amy Race Car and just have a romp. And that's that's how I sort of take the Amy Race Car issues. That's how I always did too. On the reread, like reading them all together, all the stuff that happens to Virginia Applejack is in this story. Yeah. Um, Maybe you can point some stuff out you as know, we facial go. Facial scarring and things. It's its really, uh, it's kind of uncanny. It, starting out with the terrible relationship with the mom. Right. Yeah, eventually Spanish Scott does become like a, a character in the uh, the Amy Race Car stories. Yeah, they morph. I think there's, I don't know, three or four Amy Race Car stories, maybe more than that, where they're usually like these one-shot kind of things that are a little bit on the side. But in this case, she's in this almost like a coma and it's baffling everybody. It's frustrating everybody. Scientists want to hook her up to this truth machine. And the frustrated mother is finally like, yeah, do it. And that's when they see that God vision that put her in this state. And the mother tries to kill her, which wakes her up out of the out of the coma. And she goes on the killing spree. Yeah. And now she is this like world's deadliest criminal, seductive. This is an FBI agent that she has, has working for her pretty much, uh, who's in love with her. This is the head of the FBI who she marries. Like <laughs> it's the it's pretty weird fantasy stuff, but it's that Bonnie and Clyde fantasy, you know, where she's robbing banks and it's like she steals one million, she steals two million, you know, foiling the FBI, outsmarting the police. This is a great panel right here where you have the big mink coat and you just see that yeah, like sawed really, off shotgun really piece slick. sticking out. A lot of this stuff feels like it would work as a movie. You yeah. know, like it's planned out that it would it would it would just work. Like all of the stuff would function. One of the few breaks uh, is that big bank front, a break in the eight panel grid. Uh, beautiful drawing. That's an example of seeing like the perspective with all those people going back, you know, in different planes. He can draw anything. I love this panel too. Reminds me a little bit of Gilbert Hernandez. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're definitely shades of Gilbert th throughout this stuff. Like, to me, this is the most... The, this is when I wrote the note about Jaime Hernandez. You know, the silhouettes, some of the line work, some of the lighting even. Yeah. But this is a fantasy story, and it, it's sort of... I don't know if it ever becomes uh, explicit, but it's it's... There's your reference to the Halloween costume. Oh, dig. Yeah, like whenever you see that stuff, point it, point it out for sure. Because I read the Amy Racecar stuff like sort of together. And I kind of gloss over it when I read the series in in whole. That's how I did the first time. Some of the lines on his forehead there remind me a little bit of a, almost a Jose Munoz or something. You know, it's a little bit of a different line work than we see a lot. But all the newspaper headlines, I don't know that that's a Frank Miller thing exactly, but... A lot of cartoonists will use that as a way to almost exposition caption. How fly is that Uzi? Oh, man. With just the holding line? <laughs> it's very strong. High contrast. This is great. So the FBI guy comes in to make this deal and uh, presents her with the deal, you know, from the president or whatever. And she's like, great. Sounds like uh, the two of us need each other. And then she shoots him and she <laughs> says, the president and me, <laughs> we need each other. <laughs> And what is it? She's like uh, on TV or they something? They need her to renounce that God is a, you know, that th no humans go to heaven is, is what they need. Because the world is breaking down after seeing the truth machine revealing this uh, this inner truth of, of Amy race cars. And then she's sitting there with the president who kind of falls for her and wants to work with her. And she sees the button. This is great. This is such that thing of like, we know, I know so many people this way where they do things that you it's a bad kid, right? It's a niece or a nephew who seems to not be able to help themselves from doing the thing that you know they're going to get yelled at for or you don't want them to do and you've told them a hundred times and they can't help themselves. It's a compulsion. She sees the red button on the on the White House desk. She has to hit it. <laughs> She's Amy Racecar. She has to hit that. You can't put that in front of her. <laughs> Hits it and flies away as uh, the Earth explodes, man. That's the issue. That's Superman. This is the Dave, Dave Lapham, two months of respite, recharge the batteries to, to jump back into more harrowing territories. Let's, uh, let's check out the letters page. I always like to look at the letters page and see who might have written a letter. Uh, Pittsburgh's <laughs> very own Jason Lex. This oh, is years cool. before I knew him. Uh, writing in to just tell him how great this is and compared to Sin City, thinks this is a lot better. Better characters, more detail, all those things. Remember that great, lovable 
dad character. Oh, man. Should we quit at issue six? <laughs> so 1982, uh, if you remember the dates, Virginia Applejack, I think it was 77, I believe, is whenever uh, we first saw her, whenever she had the terrible Halloween. So five years later. And things with her mother have not gone any better. Like, look at these settings. It's, it's, he... These have to be modeled on, like, you know, his aunt's house. Or, like, it, he just, he sees them so clearly. Even the interiors. Like, Absolutely. all the little little details, they just... The geography. They're throwaways. There's, like, eight eight backgrounds here in one page. We're not going to revisit any of them. It's not an animation s- setup where it's like, we're going to do the whole issue in this room. We got to know how it looks. No, it's just eight, eight dashed off backgrounds that look perfect. In this issue. But, like... We've seen this background in earlier issues. Like, so there, he's clearly modeling this on, on real stuff. And, and we, see, we see Dad, and he's got a little salt and pepper to the mustache now. Adds, yeah. adds to the time progression. And there goes, like, hatchet face mom. Almost Al Columbia in that face. Real, <laughs> that real, is not a happy, that is not a pleasant looking woman. Real easy to hate. And imagine having to draw that stuff man her dad really does look like uh, that time period like if you watch movies from say late 70s early 80s you'll see that dude yeah yeah a real marlboro man kind of character and he is he's a truck driver so you know like talk he's planning to come off the road to uh try to keep the family intact you know he recognizes they all recognize their problems between uh, virginia and her mother this is a this is a great sequence and reminds me of uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High when the one nerd boy goes on a date with Jennifer Jason Lee I think and and uh, and and forgets his wallet uh, and they go to like that sh- Wiener Schnitzel fucking restaurant and the chairs they're sitting on to like illustrate just how young they are the chairs are so gigantic and we have that kind of thing here because she's she's too old to be acting this way yeah you know but you sell it with the big chair just like kind of have her like hunching down in that way yeah the family drama is pretty big shift considering the other stories we've seen up to this point right and uh you know dad's gonna pull his last his last mission mom waves the dad off next panel the nonverbals. the scowl here she is retreating uh into her amy race car life trying to sneak out to no avail these are we're dealing with page after page of just escalating antagonism from both sides and it kind of reaches a climax here of uh the mom just completely loses control just in time for dad to come home yeah and that's tough there's no justification in his mind of what he's just seen the mother on top of Virginia just wailing away <laughs> on her. And I guess that isn't acceptable. This is not cats and jammer kids. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about making nice, man. Like, apologize to your daughter. Don't do that again. And then and then the mom is, you know, she's 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 got her point of view. Sure. Ann points out, why is he home early? And it's uh, he's, he's having some, some stomach pain, so he went and saw the doctor and has an ulcer, so he's home. Three weeks later, he's uh, it's hitting him hard, man. Yeah, it's not, he's not feeling well. That ulcer's not going away. Yeah, and, and he already doesn't look good. You know, like, if you ever met, if you ever had somebody with stage four who just discovered they had stage four and then... You know, you see them in a week or two later, like, this could happen. I, I bowled with the guy, and he had cancer and was dead within a... He was diagnosed, and within four weeks, he died. Yeah. And it was shocking, you know? It's like, we saw you twice a week for, <laughs> for the last four months, and then just quickly it happened. Yeah. And that is exactly what's happening with uh, with Pops here, man. Um, we have the, the, uh, the big sister who was... Always putting her little sister in peril. Yeah, much closer relationship with her mom. Yeah. And it's, and it's trusted with the real intel about what's happening. That's a real nuanced uh, detail, too, is the relationship between the older sister and the mom, who we've seen the older sister in 
certainly not a better person than Virginia. Right. Um, I don't know if she's markedly worse, but I mean, she's running around behind her parents' back and getting away with it, and as a result, has this better relationship. Yeah, yeah, selfish teenager stuff. And it, and it also speaks to those issues of, like, of, like, uh, how much do you let, like, a super young child know? Like, there's, like, zero right answer for that. I don't know that Dr. Spock wrote right. a chapter about, like, how to tell a, you know, nine-year-old that her dad's going to be dead in, like, eight months or whatever. Pretty good, too, seeing the two siblings having their different relationships, almost like the different parent, uh, you know, who their favorite parent is or vice versa. <laughs> right. And we're just seeing Pops, man. Like this, you know, yeah. the lovable dad just becoming just just a shell of a man. And, and even like, you know, his, his prized Orioles about to do some great shit. And he just he's not even he could give a fuck. You know, he's got he's got bigger things to worry about. Yeah, and he's he tells her, you know, he has a little bit of feedback for her at the end, and it's basically to just be her. Keep yeah. Writing, never stop writing. Yeah. Yeah. It talks about some of his regrets early, like, you know, got sent off the war before he could pursue, like, his own, you know, passions or whatever. Um, of, you know, of course, like, we know what's coming. Just beautiful. The yeah. shadow. It's so, it's such visual weight on top of the content of what we're reading. This was a hard comic to reread. Yeah. Yeah. Even knowing where the shit was going. Um, and just these, you know, just those pages of it. I mean, this this is as brutal as any violence we've, we've seen, man. Like, you know, her, her superhero has to be helped just even out of the bed and, and More than that, vomiting. The only like, ally we have seen her have right. in all of these issues, all the bad shit that's gone on to her, there's been one good part. And we're watching him die. Yeah. Lapham knows how to fuck with you, man. He nails it, man. It's it's incredible. Again, this is seven issues into a, a series that has run at this point now, I think, 85 issues or more. And this is the first arc. Like, it's incredible that you hit the ground. This first thing he's really written, this this first arc. And and, and here it goes, man. You know, it, it it's... It just ain't stopping. He hasn't kept food down in days... Uh, he can't stop vomiting. You know, go call the ambulance. Like it, it's it's the last the last straw. It's it's time, and she does. And we have this the you know the silent sequence because we don't need words to to realize what we uh, just just witnessed. I didn't even think of that that wordless sequence at the end that is so clear and and filled with emotion and wordless. Yeah. And then there she is alone great framing with the with the black on the street and in highlighting her um but that's it man in innocence of nihilism first yep. trade paperback i have to point out i just think that's a great illustration yeah i forget what that was done for that's a cover but uh really nice looking so one of the notes that i had and we didn't mention ed and i said it's run over 85 issues stray bullets uh and that's across two series there have been some one shots and things like that I start thinking about it. Cerebus, 300 issues. Savage Dragon, 250 plus issues. I'll even go out on a limb and say Fantastic Four, Stan and Jack, 100 plus issues. Stray Bullets, fourth longest running series in America by, by uh, you know, one, one creator. And I, I realize Stan and Jack's not one creator, but it's a, the same team. Right. Yeah, there it is, man. Like, uh... I did not expect this to be that high. And if you really do one creator, then it becomes number three for the longest, uh, longest continuous series by one, one person here in the U S right. After, <laughs> if you do U S it's, it's number two because of uh, <laughs> Sim. But I mean like that's, that is amazing. I, I didn't think about it when, when I started this and whenever I started trying to compile the list, it's like, Oh yeah, I guess so. Lapham took a powder for a while <laughs> and, uh, I think it was like issue 41 was like his wrap up, his coup de gras for, for the very first, uh, stray bullets series. Um, all of that stuff is collected in the Uber Alice edition. Look at that right there. You yeah. know, like that's substantial stuff. And you could tell like he was building towards something. Cause you look at the page numbers. I always think that's neat. Yeah. Um, but the, but the new series that he's working on has more issues than the original like i think he took at least like a decade or 15 year powder to do vertigo like work for higher mm -hmm. stuff and this we is be, put out by image so yeah. it's pretty easy to get your hands on if you're if you're looking to jump into stray bullets this is the way to go you get all of this plus uh, another 30 you know 30 some issues um 
pretty easy and convenient. Yes, sir. Great comics. Uh, really fun to revisit them. It's it's been it's been too long uh, since since I uh, gave these comics a reread, and you know. I'm right there now. I'm at about issue 16, 17 right now. I read one or two before bed each night. That's the positive endorsement. I have more issues out I'm reading too. So <laughs> the, the, the ultimate thumbs up is uh, I didn't quit at issue seven on the reread. Jimmy, you know what that means? We might have to do another video to cover uh, volume two if it's, if it's still fresh in your head. I was thrilled with this. It was better on the reread than I expected. I mentioned at the top of the show, you never know how this stuff's going to go. You know, I, I read this whenever I was 20 or something probably is when these issues are coming out for me. Um, sometimes that stuff is not the same when you go back and revisit it. I'm amazed by it. For like, if you think of it as like these short stories, very few people, very few comics I can point out and say that's a great short story. And this is loaded, man. Almost every one of these is standout. It's uh one of the impetuses for, for rereading this is because I'm, I am using it as a model for the stuff that I'm doing right now with, with Red Room, because I want each issue to be a satisfying experience. I'm really fucking sick of the decompressed storytelling of people uh, abusing the readership and, and you know, charging $5 to read a very boring, insignificant piece of a bigger story. Let's, let's, let's have a reason for the pamphlet to exist. And this is one of the greatest comic series ever for those reasons, having very, very satisfying issues that if you somehow skipped an issue, it's still all good. It, you know, it, it still gives you enough. Anyhow, man, we have to get back to, to making our own comics, right? Yes. All right, Kfabers, like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon. We'll notify you when uh, our next videos are available. Make sure you grab Octobriana. It's in stores now, right? Yes, everywhere. Hit, hit my Patreon up, patreon.com slash edpiskor. Three bucks get you, get you the archives, and you'll, you'll see what I mean about making these satisfying sing, single issues. What else, Jimmy? Uh, subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video to keep up with everything that we're doing and pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe merch and t-shirts at the links below this video. Jimmy, I actually got to show you some stuff that I don't think I'll ever be able to show on our <laughs> YouTube, YouTube channel uh, for fear of the entire <laughs> enterprise being banned. I mean, give these guys some marching orders. Read more comics.